Well, hello and welcome to module one. My name is Randall Root and I will help guide you through this module by introducing you to how to install Python and how to use it. Our goal is for you to be able to create a very simple program by the end of the module. To do that, we'll learn how you make a Python script and how you run that script. We'll also talk about how you can use built-in functions and even create your own simple functions. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Python is a very simple, easy to use programming language that's still very powerful. Now it runs on Windows OS, but also Mac and Linux and other things as well, which also makes it very attractive. Another feature about Python is that there are lots of people in the community that help each other to build custom functions that you can download and use for free. And since Python's easy to use and it's free and you can make commercial programs or just personal programs on your own, it's, it's a very attractive language to learn. So many people are coming to Python, not just because it's simple, but because it's also very flexible and, and powerful. Now, of course, to actually use it, you have to get it installed. So that's the next thing you have to do. The good news is there are lots and lots of tutorials and help files out there to help you get the installation to work. If you just do a quick Google search, you'll find several out there that are available. So just searching for, you know, how do you install Python? You'll see various different videos and the like that will walk you through the process. I have to say though, it's not too difficult. Let me give you some highlights. First of all, you have to choose between ver which version you want to use. Uh, you can use version two, but three is better. Um, for one thing, it's been upgraded repeatedly over the years. Uh, two stopped being upgraded quite a while ago. It's basically made for legacy applications. Now there's nothing particularly wrong with two and still many organizations use it, but most of the time, the reason why they're using it is because they've always used it, not because it's better. Three just is better, and it's recommended that you use that when you're starting a new application. Still, a lot of the commands that you run in three is applicable to two. So learning in version three will set you up pretty in pretty good straights to, to run your version two applications as well. You'll just have to make um, a few changes to make it work. And again, as we go along, I'll try to point out the key ones you need to know. Now, um, once you've decided which one you're going to use, and for this course, we need version three, you just need to go out and download it. If you want some more information about it, you can go out to python.org and get information about the different versions, but you can also go out there and just get the installation uh, files and start the installation. One thing to note is that you may actually have Python installed on your own machine. Certainly if you have a Mac, you will have Python installed. Version 2 will be installed automatically on a Mac OS. But some Windows machines also have version uh, 2 installed. If you want to find out whether it's installed or not, you can easily do this check. Just go to the Start menu. Oh, let me move this browser out of the way. Type in the command CMD to bring up a command prompt, and then type in the command Python, either with or without the exe, and then a dash and an uppercase V. The uppercase V stands for version, and I want to caution you, it is case sensitive. When you hit enter, it will show you whether or not Python is running and what version it's using. Now, if you were to type in the wrong command, that doesn't exist, or if Python didn't exist, it would give you this information saying that it's not recognized as a internal or external command. So if that comes up, then Python's not installed. If I'm using a Mac, it's gonna be pretty much the same thing. I just go to a terminal window, make sure to use the Python uh, command and a uppercase V. Again, it should show that I'm using 2.710 or something of that nature on my Mac. So in that case, that's because Python, Python or Python EXE, would actually be running the pre-installed version. If I want to install version three, and I did, I do, um, I want to type in Python three and then an uppercase V, and that would show me the version 
of Python as 3.7 and then whatever the latest sub number is. So if, um, if you're using a Mac OS, what you want to do during this class is first of all install Python 3 and then always type in Python 3 um, and then use that to, to work with the third version of, of, of Python. On a Windows machine, you just type in Python and it should map accordingly to version 3. Now, if I'm installing Python on Mac, it's pretty straightforward. The macOS installation utility is pretty streamlined. But on Windows, there's a few things I'd like to, to tell you about. Now, in either case, the first step is to go out to python.org and download the, the installation file. Uh, just clicking on the big yellow button will do it. Of course, I'm running a Windows OS right now, and so it shows me the download for Windows. But if I was running off of a Mac OS, it would actually show me the download for Mac. Once I press the button, once I press the button, uh, it'll start the download, and then I can go ahead and run the resulting executable file to start the installation. Now, with that in uh, started, there's a couple of settings I want to point out. Instead of just clicking on the install now, which actually will install at a kind of a uh, a low hidden location. You can see it's a very long path to where the files are at. I would recommend just hitting the customize installation option and then putting it in a folder of your own making. I prefer to install on C drive. On a Windows machine, we pay more attention to which drive and folder location things are at than on a Mac. And I think it makes it a lot easier to find if you put it in a simple location. In addition to that, I recommend you check the little checkbox down here that says that you want to include Python in the path. This is uh, true of both Mac and Windows. They have a particular path variable. You can see this from a command prompt. Path indicates where the operating system should look for a given command. So in my case, on this computer, when I type in Python, and I don't indicate where the Python EXE program is at, it'll start looking in the path. The path is just a location, a set of locations that I've indicated I want things to be looked through. First thing it's going to do is look in Oracle Java Java path. It's not going to find python.exe in there, so it moves on to the next one. Users, admin, download, Windows, something, 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 bin. Nope, not going to be finding it there either. It's going to go to the next one. Let's see. This one is C3 Python 3.7 scripts. That's pretty close, but I know it's not there either. It's actually in C colon Python 3.7. That's the path it's going to find. So it's going to have a couple false uh, locations where it's not going to find what it looks for. But when it finds the one it wants, it stops looking through the path. One way to speed computers up in the old days was to make sure that you put at the beginning the, the path that is most likely to be used. Anyway, I know that this is the right location because when I did the installation, I chose to put it there. And if I were to go to look at my hard drive, Windows key E, I would find my little folder here and I'd find the Python exe file right there. So what I'm recommending is that you make sure to add the, click on the checkbox to add it to the path. That just makes things certain, certain things easier. And to customize the installation, to put it in an easier folder. As I said, on the Mac OS, it's just pretty straightforward. Um, just let the installation do its thing, and you're pretty much good to go. Now, if you go out on the internet and you look for ways to install Python, you're also going to see options to install using these little package installers. On a Windows OS, uh, we use Visual Studio for a lot of things, and Visual Studio comes with various different package installers that will install Python with a bunch of additional support features. That's pretty cool, but in this class, we're not using those features. I want to keep it as simple as possible. In Mac, it's kind of the same thing. They use Homebrew. And once again, you can download an installation uh, package with a 
bunch of existi uh, existing ex uh, <laughs> excuse me, additional software that we're just not going to use. So please, just keep it simple and download it um, as I've shown you here, unless you've already got it installed and working and you don't want to mess with it. That's fine, as long as you take the responsibility for using that installation the way it's set up now. The simplest way to run Python is to open up a command window and start up the Python program. As I've shown you, the easy way to do that in Windows is to go to the Start menu, and then, oops, looks like my browser is covering that up. Go to the Start menu, and then um, type in CMD. You can also go ahead and use the Windows key R to bring up the run command and type in CMD as well. Now, once that is open, you can type in python.exe and start Python in interactive mode. If I'm using a Mac, it's almost the same. The thing, the difference is, is that on a Mac, I need to go to Finder, Applications, Utilities, and Terminal App. But once again, you'll be at a, a command prompt. You type in Python exe, or excuse me, Python 3 exe, or just Python 3, and it'll bring you into interactive mode. Now, in interactive mode, what you can do is you can interact with Python one command at a time. So I will enter in a, a command. Our simplest command is print lowercase p, it is a case sensitive language. I either use a single quote or a double quote, doesn't really matter. Put in some text, close the quote, close the parenthesis, and hit enter. And when you do, it performs the action of printing something onto the screen. Instead of using the interactive mode, another choice is to use an integrated development environment. There's a free one that comes with the Python installation. It's not necessarily the best one, but it's simple to use and it's going to be there. To start using it, you can access the start menu in a Windows environment and type in idle on the search option. So if I come over here and I type in idle, I should be able to see the idle option and at that point I launch it. If I'm using a Mac, it's going to be pretty much the same thing I just have to look under Applications, Python, and then Idle App. Now, from there, I'm in an interactive window, in which case I can type in print. And pretty much do the same thing I did from the terminal window. But I can do more. One of the things I can do is I can create a brand new file and put multiple commands in that file. So I type in the same commands, but I can have several different commands in one file. There's a way of doing it interactively as well, but this is kind of the way we're going to be working with things. Now, this is a file, and I have to save the file before I can run it. So I hit save. It'll ask me where I want to save it. What I'm going to recommend is that we make a folder called underscore Python class and then put our files in there. For example, I've got a subfolder called demo code and I'm going to make a little test file called testpy. That's one I usually use for demonstrations. And I'll save the file as that. If that file didn't exist, I go to that location and I just type in down here test.py. Hitting enter will save the file. If you're on a Windows environment, I recommend you put that folder right on C drive. It makes it easy to find. If you're on a Mac, don't put it on your desktop, put it under documents. In actually both cases, I don't recommend you put your files on your desktop. There are rare occasions where this can cause a problem, but in general, you end up with a bunch of cluttered mess. So try to be a little bit more organized than that and uh, make sure you know where you put this folder because we're gonna be using it later on. Anyway, once you've typed in the command, the thing to do is to run those commands. And you do that by just coming up to the Run menu option and say Run Module. You can also hit the F5 uh, button. Notice that it runs both our commands. And you can run it multiple times. I don't have to type it in again, I can just run it. And the nice thing is I can actually go ahead and, let's see, copy and paste. Oops. 
add some code, and run it again, and I can see the changes that have occurred. Now this window does get, this uh, shell window does get kind of busy uh, as you keep running the code. Uh, unfortunately, they didn't put a ability into the um, shell to clear itself out. But if you close the shell and then you just run the command again, it'll open up a, a blank shell with just a, the previous or the current uh, result of your, your script file. A script file is just a file with Python script in it. That's it. So what we're going to do now is have you do an exercise. If you haven't installed Python, take the time to go ahead and install it. And then open up idle and try to run the print command, just like you've seen here. Note down what it does. I want, what I mean by that is I really want you to write down like on a piece of paper or type it into some kind of text editor. How would you describe it to somebody else? What they've learned in education uh, is that humans learn best if we learn by, by a, a bunch of different ways. So I want you to be able to, to talk about something. I want you to be able to perform so, that something. You know, so perform some programming, talk about programming, read about programming, watch about programming, and write about programming. It doesn't have to be fancy in this case, uh, but just take a moment to jot down how you would describe what it's doing. And when you're done, come back and uh, we'll continue. Go ahead and pause the video and give it a shot. So hopefully that was painless, getting the installation done and getting idle to, uh, to run your code. After you got both of those going, you just had to write something down about what it did. Now what's happening here is that when you're using idle, whether you're in the interactive mode where you just type in um, print test and you hit enter, or if you're using a Python file and you're submitting this code to be processed. In both of those cases, what's occurring is that the idle integrated development environment is sending these commands over to be processed by the Python executable. It says, if we came over, launched Python, and ran that code. So what you wrote down is just kind of what your impression was. It didn't matter so much what you wrote down as long as you took a moment to jot down your thoughts. Just pausing and jot down your thoughts. That uh, is very useful uh, when you learn something, so just taking simple notes is, is handy. Okay, hopefully all that went well. We're moving on to the next piece. Let's take a moment to talk about what a console application is. A console application is the type of application that you typically make when you first start programming in Python. One of the nice things about them is that they're very simple and they're easy, easy to use as well as make. Now, they aren't as fancy as like a windowed application with buttons and drop-down boxes, etc., or a web application with buttons and drop-down boxes, but you can use it from a browser but once again, they're easier to make by a long shot, and they're a great place to get started. In addition to that, console applications are something that is easy to uh, use and automate. And a lot of times, you will find that console applications are created to do administrative, uh, administrative work that um, the average user doesn't necessarily have to, to deal with. For example, um, anything where they have a command terminal or console might have several different applications that you are unaware of until you need them. The classic uh, console application that people use um, on a regular basis is troubleshooting network connectivity using either IP config or IF config. IF config is for the Unix uh, Mac environment, Linux environment. Uh, IP config for the Windows environment, but both do kind of the same thing. They give you information about the configuration of your network, a uh, network uh, card. So if I were to open up a command console, well, I got one open here, looks like I do. And let me clear it out, let me exit out of Python first. I'll clear the screen. And then I'm gonna type in IP config, and I'll get information about my network card. 
If I'm using a Mac, it's going to be very similar. It's going to have a different format, but it is similar. If you think about it, the Python command a print prints things to a screen. And when I run ipconfig, it's printing things to the screen as well. It prints data so I can have information about what's going on in my network card, how it's configured. That's what we're seeing here. We're seeing a bunch of print statements to pull information, or excuse me, data from the computer and present it as information to the end user. That's a handy thing. And you see this in a variety of different applications. So you will find that not only is creating a console application easy to do, but it's also useful for a number of things. And often if you're planning on using Python um, at your work, You'll start by making simple, useful, easy to run automation tools using a console application and Python. Go ahead and try doing this next lab, which is basically just opening up the command console window, typing in ipconfig or ifconfig on the Mac and running that. See that it prints out just like I showed you and then try running Python the same way. So we'll do the same thing on uh, Python, but we're going to use an option here uh, with a question mark. Let me show you what that is. And we'll see how it prints things out. Go ahead and do that and uh, pause the video, give it a shot and then come back. Okay, now that you had a chance to do that, hopefully you've kind of clear that what we're seeing here is help information. So Python is giving us information about how the Python executable program works. You can see here the usage is Python and then anything with square brackets means that it's an option. So <clears throat> the idea is that you can have one or more of these options. Uh, one of the options that's going to be important to us is the file option. The file option is how you enter in a Python script file that you want to run. So for example, when we made this file over here under Python class demo code test py, let me see if I can find that. <coughs> Excuse me. Python code, or class file, demo code, test py. I'm going to copy that path because that's a nice feature. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and type in Python and then put in the name of the file. Now, come on now. There we go. And what will happen is that when I hit enter, it'll run it. And I would have gleaned that by kind of looking at this set of instructions. Now I have to say, this is not a great way to learn how to run Python, but if you forget something, you can look it up and go, oh yeah, that's how I do it. That is handy. And of course, what we're demonstrating here is what is the console application and how console applications can be used to print information out to the user. Well, that's it for this lab. Not very exciting, but hopefully you got it to work. Let's move on. As I've just shown you, you can place code in a file and then execute that file using the Python uh, program. So Python exe. Now, when you put code in a file and it's scripting code, Python scripting code, it's a Python file or a Python script file. That's it. A Python script file or just a script file is a file with code in it. You can have JavaScript files and Python script files and Perl script files and SQL script files. It, um, they're all in all those cases. They may have a different extension. So typically the extension for a Python script file is py. SQL, SQL, um, Perl is PL, um, let's see, JavaScript, JS, but in the end, it's the same thing. It's just different languages uh, being used inside of a text file. 
that we store uh, as a, a script file. We store code in a script file. Now, you can find out some more information. I try to provide you uh, links throughout the uh, the notes here to go, to go out and do some more research. But that's basically it. Still, it's usually not a bad idea to go out and click on those and, and go out and take a look to see what they say. A lot of times uh, they'll have additional information that is probably just uh, easier to understand and um, than just watching a video by going out and, and reading that. So when you get a chance, take a look at it. You saw that uh, I went ahead and used idle for my editing tool. But to tell you the truth, folks, you can use any editing tool that you want that would edit a text file. So I could use Notepad. I could put the text in Notepad and then save it with a PY extension and run that. You know, um, to tell you the truth, if I come back over here and I take off the the PY extension, I go, um, I don't know, X, Y, Z. It's not mapped to anything. I want to come back over here and I'm run this again. I'm going to use the up arrow to retype my code. X, Y, Z. It still works. The advantage of the um, extension on there is that it can associate the file with particular programs. In this case, it can associate the, the file um, with a program and editing tool called PyCharm, but I could also have it associated with uh, running it from out of Python. So if I come here and I run it out of Python, notice that it runs. Now you also notice that when it runs out of Python, oh, that's not what I had in mind. I want to zoom in, run with Python. Can I get a picture of that? Uh, it looks like I can't. Okay. I'll zoom in with the uh, Camtasia software. When I run it, um, run that, it opens the command window real briefly and then shuts it down. As soon as it finishes running, it shuts it down. Um, we, uh, if you have the window open, I could just drag and drop that window in here and then try to run it. Let's see if I can do that. Notice that in this case, it doesn't understand what to do with it. I had a, a slash at the end, but if I take off the slash, now it understands what to do with the PY file. And what it believes I need want me to do with it is to send that PY over to the Python interpreter for processing. And for the most part, that's exactly what I wanted it to do. Now, this would not work unless there was an associated association between the PY file and um, my Python um, environment. See if I come over here and I try this again. This time I'm going to go ahead and use the same thing. I'm going to take off the Python and I'm going to rechange that name back over to come on, X, Y, and Z. So it'll find the file, but it won't know what to do with it. This file does not have an app associated with it for performing the action. Please install an app, or if there's one already installed, create an association. So that's what's going on with that. Now, if you're using a Windows machine um, and you cannot see the extension, make sure you come over here and click on the uh, file name extensions checkbox. On a Mac, it's similar. You just have to, to go find it. I can't remember it, where it is off the top of my head, but a quick search on show file extensions on your Mac, you'll, you'll find it. Um, as a uh, uh, possible potential developer, you really need to understand and see the file extensions. You need to get up to a different level of user. Now you're actually going to start making the programs that people use. So make sure that you show those extensions. They're handy to know about, and hopefully this uh, example kind of showed you why. Of course, what we really want to get into is the actual programming piece. So let's talk about programming. The programming basics uh, that you need to know are that programming is um, the act of telling the computer to perform actions, typically on particular pieces of data. So a piece of data would be something like a person's name or a phone number. Uh, it could be something like the word test, like we used uh, just a minute. And the operations could be something like print the word test to the screen. Now. When I tell the computer to perform some kind of action, 
and uh, that is uh, a statement. I use a programming statement to do that. And programming statements will consist of a single instruction to the computer. I want you to do this. In addition to programming statements, you will have things like comments, you will have namespaces, you will have sometimes directives. So we, um, a program will consist of data and operations, and those operations are usually performed on the data by telling your computer to do something in a statement. And in addition to that, you'll have comments, namespace, and directives. Comments are just little notes for the human to, to look at. It helps the human understand what you meant to do, what you're trying to accomplish. It also helps you uh, as a human to go back and, and see your comments about what you were thinking of at the time. Namespaces are a way to organize code. It'll be best to kind of give you, to, for you to understand how they work when we get to using them later on. But let me just put it this way. You can actually take your statements and group them together into something called a function. So if I have a, a set of one or more statements that I group into a function, I could call my function uh, print menu. But you might make a function called print menu as well. If we were to try to combine our two programs together, how would we solve the fact that we have two functions with the exact same name? Well, we could do so by adding on a namespace. Much like your, your own personal name um, may be similar to somebody else's, so there could be two Randalls and a particular group of people, my last name and their last name is probably different. And so if we have that additional part of the name, we can distinguish between them. Directives are something that's not a programming statement per se. It's a statement that gets uh, sent to the computer to perform some uh, additional accessory action to your program or for your program to run effectively. So an example of this would be, I want you to, to import some code from another file so I can use it. So I might uh, go through and, and indicate where that file is, uh, what that file is, so I can go grab that. You're not actually doing telling the computer to perform an action that's part of the flow of your logic, the things you're trying to accomplish, the actions you're trying to accomplish. Instead, you're just giving it a directive, oh, and please go get this and uh, do that kind of uh, on the side while we continue, or just before we continue uh, doing the actual logic of our program. Of course, the, the main piece that you, you work with is the statements. And the statement, again, is one instruction. And the statement is going to be made up of one or more keywords. Sometimes we'll use symbols. Sometimes uh, the keywords or symbols are referred to as tokens. So if you ever hear about that, that's what they're talking about. And you can have one or more uh, tokens or uh, per statement. So here's a, an example of three little statements. This uh, statement is x is equal to 4. So that's one statement. X, y is equal to 5. That's another statement. And z equals x plus y. That's a third statement. All of these are statements that tell the com computer to perform some kind of action. Now, you must remember that the computer is although fast, not very smart. So you have to be quite clear about what you want the computer to do. Uh, that includes saying when you're done with a statement. In some languages, and many languages, uh, what they do is when you're done with a statement, they will put a semicolon at the end. So right at the end of each statement, they'll put a semicolon. You can do that in Python, it accepts it. But it's not required. And uh, what is required is for you to enter in a some kind of indicator, and the indicator is normally a carriage return. One of the things that makes Python a little bit easier to type, and perhaps even a little bit easier to read, is the fact that it kind of flows logically by using these carriage returns. So x equals 4, carriage return. You hit the enter key on your keyboard. Next statement, y equals 5, carriage return. That's the next statement flows is to z equals y plus x. Carriage return finishes up that statement. You're done. Now you can put semicolons in, and it's um, I think it's useful uh, on occasion. Certainly, it's mandatory in other languages. Like if I program in C sharp, I have to put a semicolon there. If I'm programming in the SQL database language, uh, depending on the database product, it's mandatory as well. Oracle it's mandatory. My SQL is mandatory. Microsoft SQL Server, not mandatory. So it really is going to depend on what language you're programming in as to whether or not they have a, a visible 
statement terminator or an invisible one like the carriage return. It's still there, but carriage returns are invisible. Anyway, um, you will see that sometimes in my, my demonstrations, I will have a semicolon there just to, to show it can be done. But it's not considered the appropriate for the Python faithful. You will find that this community, the Python community, is very passionate about programming, and that's that, that's fun. Um, it's also you know useful because they also are very passionate about helping people and getting people involved. However, the downside of that is uh, sometimes people will be um, a little upset if you actually put in the semicolons, which are optional, have always been, uh, that you're not being a purist. You're not really understanding how Python works. To tell you the truth, it doesn't really matter. That's my opinion anyway, but to them, it does. So my recommendation is if you're in an environment where it matters to people, don't put them in. Don't put in the semicolons. If you're in your own environment and you think it's appropriate, put them in. Try to stick to, in one script, in one file, try to script uh, stick to either using semicolons to terminate the statement or not. And then when you go into another script, you can change your mind. But try to be consistent within a script, and it's probably be, uh, best to be cons consistent on a particular project you're working on as well. Consistency in programming is a real boon uh, long term. Another thing that's a real boon or benefit in a program is the appropriate use of comments. Now comments, as I mentioned, are notes that the human can read. And it's really quite simple to, to create a comment. You just type in a pound sign in this language and then some kind of note to yourself. It's never going to be ran by the computer, so you can misspell it, um, you can uh, punctuate it, you can type it uppercase, lowercase, whatever, any way you want. It's really just a note. Of course, you should make it so it's legible, but it's just going to be a note to the other human. In this case, this is just a standard inline Python comment. The, uh, the idea would be that when I write a little bit of code, I might add a comment in there to, to tell me something about that statement. For example, if I'm using the 2x version of Python, you don't use parentheses. You just type in print, no parentheses uh, with test inside and either double single quotes. That would be a note that I might leave to myself or to a student. You can have more than one line of comments. Uh, if you do, you can either just use a pound sign multiple times on each line, or if you'd like, you can use three uh, single quotes, and that will make what's known as a block comment. A block comment is, allows you to make a comment, um, multiple lines of comments, so you can read it more. Like here, I've got a, a little comment that says both these statements are uh, commented out Commenting out means I've com uh, highlighted and put them in a comment. Commented out for testing. Uh, what you do is sometimes is that when you're testing some code and uh, you, you think it's not working because it's one line or two lines of code, is you comment them out. You put them behind a comment and then they no longer run and you can see if the problem goes away when those lines of code are commented out, then that was probably where the issue was. So. This is just a note where I've actually said everything between the first three quotes and the last three quotes are to be considered a human readable comment. Other languages use this style. They put a slash and then they put a star and then they put a star and a slash and anything between those is a comment. Now that's very common in a number of languages. Uh, including the SQL language, the C language, so C, C++, C Sharp, uh, Java. Well, actually, a lot of languages use that, but in Python, we don't. We use a, uh, a triple quote. Uh, do note that the triple quote was not officially uh, created for a block comment. It's a, uh, a way of actually saying that the string should be interpreted as is, uh, including all the little visible um, or excuse me, invisible characters that go along with it. But people have been using it for uh, unofficially for a block comment because block comments are so dang handy. Now I mentioned that when I'm using a comment, I can make things uppercase, lowercase, uh, I can misspell them, etc. It doesn't care because it's never going to run that code. 
But if you make a computing statement, if you make a programming statement, it does care about that. In general, many languages are case sensitive. So the command print with a lowercase p and the command print with a uppercase p are considered two different statements. One will be officially interpreted and understood as to what you want it to do, the command that you want it to do, and the other will be like, mm, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's important to, to know that whatever language you're working with, um, you need to know whether or not it's case sensitive or not. In general, uh, there are a few languages that are not case sensitive. Uh, for example, uh, the SQL language is not case sensitive. Microsoft's Visual Basic languages are not case sensitive by design. Other languages though, like Microsoft C Sharp and C and the C++, Java, uh, and of course Python are case sensitive, so you need to be careful. If you're used to doing things like working with Excel, maybe doing some um, um, scripting or, um, let's see, not scripting, uh, programming in, with the Visual Basic for applications, you're probably not used to the fact that it's case sensitive. And a lot of people have got their start in programming doing things like that, doing certain automations and that. But here it's true. So please be careful as you're typing your code. Quite often what we see in the beginning programmers is that the code's almost right, but something like the, the P is, is uppercase or lowercase when it shouldn't be. In general, most of the functions that are built into Python are lowercase. So that's something to guess at, but I said most. You can't always be 100% sure that what you're working with will be all lowercase. So you may have to, to look up the documentation. You may have to figure out what it is. Now, as I said, most of the Python functions are lowercase, but when you make your own functions or you create your own variables, you get to choose whether to make things uppercase or lowercase or any combination you want. To help with that decision, uh, python.org has printed out a little style guide that you can use. Some people get pretty involved with making sure that they adhere to the style guide. In our course, we're, we're looking at basic programming in general. We're using Python as the medium to understand the basics of programming. So it's a little bit less important than working in a pure Python environment. Uh, our goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to read. Um, so I'll be using things like uppercase and lowercase to make things easier to read. That is my personal preference. But I think it's good for you to know uh, what those, that style guide looks like. So if you come over here and you click on that link and you take a look at this, I don't recommend you read through this entire thing. Just note that it's out there and you can kind of go out and, and take a look at the options. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is this, uh, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. The idea being that you want to make your code legible. You want to make it consistent, but you don't necessarily need to have to follow every aspect of this guide. The guide is out there as a recommendation to kind of give you some kind of framework on making that decision about what you want to do. So uh, again, go ahead and take a look at it when you get a chance. Uh, do be aware that we are going to, to deviate from those standards where I think it's appropriate. And um, um, I think you'll find that uh, going forward in your Python career, that just knowing that this exists and kind of uh, being able to go and reference that will be useful to you. Now, Python has a bunch of built-in functions that you will use throughout the course. And certainly, although we won't cover all of them by any means, there's so many of them, um, we will use a lot of them, and each module will introduce new ones for you to play with. Uh, the first two that are important to us in this module is print. We've already seen print. Uh, it allows you to print information out to the, the user on the screen. Uh, another one that's very useful for us is the input. The input function allows us to get information from the user. So we can take the information that the user types in and convert it into data to be used in our program. The, um, the way it look, works is, like the print statement, you type in the word input. Uh, you use parentheses, you don't put anything inside there, you can, but you don't have to. And what will happen is that when you use it, it will pause the program and allow the user to type something in. When they hit the enter key, it'll submit that back to the program. Now, normally what you do 
is you capture that submitted um, submitted data. In this case, I'm not doing it. I'm just using it to to pause. But um, that's how, how you normally work with it. So let me go ahead and come back over here and do a quick little demonstration. PY, remember how we did this before. And I said I could come over here and run this. See how it flashed on the screen? I'm going to go ahead and modify this with idle. I notice how it runs, opens idle, and I can run it from here. But what I want to do is I want to put in the input command. Now, once I type the input into the, um, the script file, let me go ahead and run the module. It says run module, run script, same thing. Code module is another word for uh, a script file. So you can see that there's a, a flashing cursor there, and if I hit enter, it will come back with um, the three chevron there. If I go ahead and put in print, and I run it again, you can see it paused, it hasn't got to the end yet. And when I hit enter, it prints the end and then finishes running the script. Now, if I come over to that uh, file and I send it over to be ran by the Python executable, you can see that when the window pops up, it pauses. It pauses waiting for me to continue. Some people will put in an input command just like this, just to pause the program for a minute so that when the user is done, if they've read this information, they hit enter and it closes. Now notice that that window closed so quickly that you never saw the word end being printed. It was printed, it just happened so quickly it was gone. So if that was the purpose, you wouldn't actually need to put anything after that because this will show, it'll show up so quickly and then it ends and the, the window closes. Still, the fact of the matter is, is that there are times where people will go through and create these little these little files, they'll make like a something called a batch file. A batch file is just some kind of automation file that you use to, to run a program. Let's see, let's say run my uh, app. And the extension on them is BAT. Now this is not a pr Python programming file, but you do something with a in Mac called uh, with a B, uh, a bash file, same kind of thing. Anyway, so what I do is I just go ahead and uh, I'll open this with um, Notepad's a good one. Let's see, open with code, edit. There we go. And <clears throat> I just want to go ahead and tell it to run Python. And then the name of this this script file. You may remember how we did that from the command console. Well, basically what this does is, when you double click on the batch file, it runs that the Python exe and sends over the file for processing. And then it starts up, it pauses for a minute, and then when I'm done, I just hit enter. And it moves on. Oh, come on. So let's say this was up on my, my desktop. And I just double clicked on that. It would bring up the, the window. I hit enter and it's done. And that's the way people will set up kind of automation on their uh, program, uh, their computer. So they'll have a Python script file and they may have a batch file or bash file to, to, to launch it. Uh, one thing good about this is I could actually go ahead and launch multiple types of applications with this. So I could actually launch something called a SQL command mode and send that a script file for processing after I get this one up and running. It's a very powerful feature, and you can see I'm in SQL command mode now. I 
and I can do multiple things by combining my commands in the these batch files or bash files. Anyway, that's uh, that's what that the input command does. Now, normally, what, how we use it is we we capture capture the data from the input. Let me show you that real fast. So what happens is I make a variable up, x. My preference is to be more descriptive. So I'll usually call it like data. But I want to tell it what type of data. So I'll put in here str for string, a string of data, a string of characters, individual characters. And then I will go ahead and print out the string of data like this. Well, you'll see me do this on a regular basis as we go through the course. So now when I run this, you can see it says start. I enter in anything I want and it echoes it out because I've captured that data. That's typically how we use input. Now this is just module one, so don't don't stress too much about it. But that's 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 how we use print and input. And those are two things, those are two functions, built-in functions, we're gonna be using a lot. Let's go ahead and try another lab. Uh, this time I'd like you to pause the video and try to do the following. So add some code that's shown here, print, uh, input, data. I don't know why I didn't put in str data, uh, but it doesn't matter. Um, and then print the data and then just print a little uh, statement at the end that, that shows that this works and ends. It's kind of what I just showed you. See if you can make it work on your machine. And then once you got it working, just write down what it does. Again. Just pause, take a moment. It doesn't have to be really fancy. Just kind of make a little note about what it does. Write a little note to yourself. Okay, I'll let you pause the video and do that, and then we'll get started again. I had mentioned custom functions earlier. So print and input are both built-in functions, but you can make your very own. A function is a collection of one or more programming statements. The idea is that you have statements that you want to w run as a group. So you type out the statements, you test them, and then you wrap the statements into a function. The syntax for doing that is to define the function, come up with a name. You can make up any name you want. Um, there are some things that you should avoid. You should not put a number first. You should put letters first. Uh, the standard Python convention is for it to be lowercase with underscores between each word, like demo function, demo underscore function. That's not my preference. My favorite preference is to have a combination of uppercase and lowercase. And as we go through the course, you may see some of that, uh, just to kind of give you some exposure to it. But um, the standard Python convention is to have it lowercase or snake case, as they call it got these little uh, lines and they dip down and then they come back up again, a little snake casing. You put in parentheses um, and then you put in a colon and after the colon you put in your one or more statements. Now it's important that you indent. The indentation can either be like two spaces or four spaces or a tab. Whatever you choose, you need to be consistent. The standard is four spaces. I often don't put four spaces in my notes because um, it has a tendency to, to kick it over far enough that I need the extra room. But certainly there's nothing wrong with four spaces or even six or eight spaces uh, and two is, is just fine as well. Whatever you choose though, you need to be consistent in that script. So I know that these two print statements are part of the demo function uh, function because of the indentation. If you wanted to, you could put a little note at the end of your functions. Uh, this is not a, a recommended practice by uh, the Python standards, but it certainly makes things easier to read for some folks. So if you find it easy to read, um, to have a little comment there, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you can just put one at the end. Now, once you've defined the function, you, it doesn't actually do anything until you call the function. So the way you call the function is you put in the name, not with the, def the, the define keyword, you just put in the name of the function. You put in the parentheses without the colon, and that calls the function. Now, don't worry. This is just an introduction to what a custom function looks like. We're gonna get into much more details about this later on, and you'll get really comfortable with using it. 
but I just wanted to give you a, a kind of a heads up about what a custom function looked like. And this is one. So if I were to take this code and copy it and put it in a idle window, Now, it's not going to be happy when I copy it out of that uh, PDF file. It uh, It's not happy with this because I've got to put in, I've got to put in all of the um, the carriage returns and the, uh, the spaces or tabs. So there's two spaces there, there's two spaces there. I could have just hit a tab, that would have worked too, as long as it was consistent. And as I said, if I leave this off, let me comment this out and I'll run it. It runs successfully, but it doesn't do anything because it never calls a function. It just defines it. Now, let me uncomment this. This will now call the function after it's been defined and it runs those statements. So that's what a custom function looks like. And as I said, we're going to work with functions quite a, a bit as we go forward in the course. You'll become very used to them. I just want to give you a, a quick look at what a custom function looked like. Now you may have noticed that the function has these invisible characters, the, the spaces that form the indentation. And the fact that the function ends um, is commented out on my code, but certainly that's not necessary. If that comment's not there, you just have to know that the fact that it's not this next line of code is not indented means that this line of code here is not part of the function. Typically, a developer will put an additional space there, but there's no other indication. Turns out that what we see here is the call to the function in the main body of my script file. That's in the main body of my script file. The, um, the concept of a, a main uh, part of your script file uh, is kind of important to know because most programming environments use something like this. The idea is that you need to have some place for your program to start. The code above is just getting things setting up, set up and ready to start, but the code doesn't actually start to hit the main area. So this would be the, the main portion of my script. And the idea is I put all the functions at the top that I want to, um, to load up in, uh, in uh, readiness for running the main body of my script. And then after I get all everything set up, then I actually start the main body of the script. In other languages, they literally have a function called main, and that's the starting point where all your code gets started when the application runs. But in Python, it's invisible, kind of like those tabs are invisible, it's kind of like the end of the, the, the function is invisible. In other languages, you start the function with a curly brace and you end the function with a curly brace. Uh, a number of languages do that. And so it's really clear where things start and end. But Python's not that way. To save you some typing, they're using basically invisible um, invisible uh, aspects of the, the text that you're putting in there. It takes a little getting used to, but you do as time goes on. Notice that, um, again, in this example, the, the function loads into memory, but doesn't perform any action. Then when it gets down to the name, the next part of the code, the main body of the code, after things like the functions have loaded, it starts performing actions. First thing it does is print. Then it calls the demo method. Now notice that in this case, I'm not using underscores. Again, that you can, that's a personal choice. So I'm using the uh, standard that other languages use. When it calls that demo method, it jumps up there. It runs through the first and second statement. And when it finishes running that, it jumps back to where it was called and continues on. So we start in main. We print out the print statement, then go to demo method. It call the demo method. It jumps up to the demo method, runs those two statements, jumps back to our print statement here, and then ends the, the main script. There's nothing indicating where the end of the main body of the script is, but that's where 
the invisibly that's where it's going to be where the last command in that main portion of your script is. Everything else gets to be loaded up before that. And I'd like you to try this other lab. What I want you to do is, oops, I see there's a mistake there. I'll have to fix that. Uh, I want you to create a, uh, a Python script file in idle for uh, lab 1-4 uh, in this case. And then type in that code. Go ahead and run it and see if you understand what it does. Uh, after your runs, just make a little note again. You're, you're practicing the art of, of reading about something, trying to understand it, trying to perform the action, and then noting down what it does. Trying to get all the little avenues of your brain working so that uh, you can really get your, uh, a deeper understanding of your knowledge. So give it a shot. Go ahead and run that and uh, make a, a note. And when you get done, go ahead and restart the video and move on to the, or move on to the next topic. Well, it looks like the next topic is actually our last topic in this module. And it has to do with script headers. Whenever you're writing out a script, it can be really quite complex. And a very common thing to do in, uh, in the real world is to leave a, uh, a basic note about what the script is and what it does. So a script header is just a, a comment at the beginning of your script. And typical things you put up there would be the name of your script, just the title. If somebody renames the file, you can at least see that the old title used to be. A description, just a brief description of what it's supposed to do. And then some kind of um, way of logging changes to your file. One of the things that you can be pretty sure of is that once you write a piece of code, unless you stop using it, you're probably going to need to, to make some changes to it over time. And if you're not making changes to it, your coworkers may be able to. A very important aspect of programming is to make sure that you note when you make changes. It's really pretty easy to do. Uh, unfortunately, many people don't, and you will find out as you become more uh, experienced in programming that that is a major flaw. You really need to, to practice doing this. So uh, a change log would consist of usually who made the change, when they made the change, and what change they made. So I would say, okay, well, at first I just indicate that I create the new file. And that would go at the top of my, my script. So I just make a little area up here to make it look pretty. I might put in some, some fancy things, but all I really need is just a couple lines of comments. So like the title and let's see, description. and then my, my change log. And I just type that in. Now, if I want to make it look pretty, I can you know put extra lines in there, et cetera, but it's not necessary. And you also will see people just put in the, the triple string up there. That's fine too. It, it doesn't matter. It's just a comment to let you know what's happened. And if I come back and I change something, like I come back and I add in uh, an aspect to it, I should make a note of that. Like in this case, it shows that the next day I came back and I modified the script to add um, capture of the user input. That is a script header. It's an important concept when you're learning a program. And certainly in this course, I'm going to ask that any time that you turn in work, um, it has the script, uh, script header at the top. That's going to be mandatory. Well, as you've seen, our first module was jam-packed. We had a lot of things to talk about. Uh, we talked about what Python is and how you install it. We talked about how you run um, a Python program and how you uh, make a console application, what a console application is. We talked about what a script file is and the basics of programming. We talked about uh, coding standards and where you'd find more information about uh, Python coding standards, and also how we would uh, to comment out things in your program, what the main body of the, the a program is or script is, uh, how you make your own custom function, and what a script header is. I'd like you to, to think about those things. In fact, it's really a good idea to just, again, try to, to answer these questions. Take a moment to, to write out um, what the answer is to these questions just another way of, of putting it into your brain. Think about this way. Think about this exercise as uh, if you had to be in an interview or you were telling a coworker about what you've learned, what would you say if they ask you these questions? Once you have 
this down, once you have be able to answer these questions, like if somebody asks you them, you're pretty good to go on to the next portion of the, the, the module, which is actually looking at how other people talk about these topics, reading about uh, different aspects um, of, the, of these topics on the internet, uh, reading uh, the textbook, um, and uh, of course doing the assignment uh, for this module. Um, that should prepare you very, very well and uh, allow you to move on to the next module, and I will see you there.